Hi folks, welcome to the introduction to New Electromagnetism version 5. New Electromagnetism is the fourth paper in the Ethereal Mechanics series. In this video we're going to look introduce New Electromagnetism version 5. And we're going to make a clarification from the electrogravity paper regarding pre difference between pretonic and electric charge. And then we're going to overview the releases that are upcoming in the new electromagnetism V5 releases. What's already released and what is to be released. These are the models of new electromagnetism V5 that were in the end of the electrogravity video series. And in the video series we use lowercase q's to represent this and upper case choose to represent this. I'm color coding these right now because we need to make a, a clarification of something to avoid confusion. Okay, just so you know, I'm going to point out some other items here. This is the electric force model. This is the magnetic force model and this is the inertial force model. The units of force here are square amperes, which is the natural unit of force. Okay, to convert to legacy force, you multiply each by Km. Km is mu over 4 pi. And this is new electromagnetism V5 represented in legacy units of newtons, which would be kilogram meter per second squared. Okay, so if you understand the previous version of force is square, coulo uh, square amperes, which is coulomb squared per second squared, you multiply by Km. The coulombs cancel and you get kilogram meters per second squared. So that's how you convert from legacy units, between legacy units and natural units. Okay, these are Vortrix equations. Now, for the electric force model and the inertial force model, the Vortrix equations and vector equations are it's essentially the same thing. It's the magnetic force model that is different. You cannot just plug this equation into MATLAB or some other simulation tool and get a valid answer. You have to use Vortrix algebra and we're going to go into that in this video series. And the reason why we're going to show new electromagnetism in legacy units going forward is because legacy, uh, no one has made instruments yet that measure in natural units. So for this video series, we're going to use everything in legacy units. And of course, what we're going to show legacy units is highlighted in blue to distinguish them from natural units, which will just be regular black text. Okay, so let's get into the clarification between electric versus pretonic charge. From the electrogravity video EM0304, we learned that the electric force, Coulomb force, is derived from the magnetic and inertial forces that arise between two second order systems of pretons. In other words, an electron is a second order system of pretons. A proton is a second order system of pretons. Okay, so if you use these two models here, the models shown with the green Coulombs, and you compute the effects between each of the source charges to each of the target charges and for all the orientations and you do all of that math okay you will come up with a model that looks identical to electric charge okay and this is showing that right here so if you take this system here using pretonic charge and you compute using these models all the couplings between all these two charges between these two charges and then for systems where the distance between the systems is much, 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 much greater than the orbital radius, all of the computations reduce to one simple equation, which is what we're calling the electric force model. And if you get rid of this Vs, it's identical to Coulomb's law or Coulomb's model. Okay, and in this approximation here, you don't have to go from the individual pretons, you can just cheat. The, this system as one point charge of twice two pretons as a single point charge 
and you can treat the target as a single point charge as well and you can use the distance which would be R in this case would just be the center distance from the source to the target. So this is the electric force approximation. You can do it the hard way or for when the distance is much greater than R0 you can use the electric force approximation here. And of course because you're treating these as one single charge instead of a system of charges this would of course be the electric charge approximation. So what was done to make everything interoperable okay, we have the unit electric charge which would be what the electron has is comprised of two negative protons that spin at the speed of light. The spin velocity is integral to the generation of the electric force. Without spin, there is no electric force and therefore no electric charge. The protonic charge is independent of spin and therefore protonic charge is much more fundamental. And so in the legacy system, they have the unit of electric charge is 1.603 times 10 to the 19 coulombs. And because this unit of the coulomb is completely arbitrary, and because protonic charge is more fundamental, it is also the gravitational charge. I'm going to use air quotes there. Okay, the, where we are going to repurpose the Coulomb as the basic unit of pretonic charge. Okay, so now we're going to say that the unit pretonic charge is also 1.603 times 10 to the 19 Coulombs. So that would make that the pretonic charge of, the, of each electron is one half, is, in other words, the electron SOSOP is made up of two half unit charges. And therefore, if you sum them together, the electric charge equivalent of the electron is the unit charge. So we're intentionally using the unit charge that still correlates to the electron, but saying that the protons are half of that. Therefore, everything that we're going to use in the future is going to be compatible with what has been done in the past. Okay, and now for interoperability, negative protons are half the unit charge, or negative half the unit charge, and positive protons are one-third the unit charge. Again, for interoperability, the electric charge of an electron is comprised of one unit charge of negative protons that spin at the speed of light. The electric charge of a proton is comprised of one unit charge net of positive protons that spin at the speed of light. The present model for the proton is that a proton has six positive protons and two negative protons for a net of one unit charge of positive protons. This convention allows the ampere to represent both protonic and electric current, causes them to work out to be the same thing, and so everything is interoperable. But again, remember, you have no electric charge if protons are not spinning. That is, a dis that is the difference. And, but because protons and electrons are always spinning, it will always work out at the speed of light. It will always work out right now that your electric charge and your protonic charge are going to be the same thing. Or the same value. Okay, so therefore, what we can do with the other models of of new electromagnetism is that we can treat electrons or charged particles using the, ch the electric charge approximations and we can do this for the magnetic force and the inertial force. We're now in this case instead of going from preton to preton and of course we can use this as long as the distance between the systems is much 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 greater than the radius of the system. And therefore, we can treat an electron or proton or whatever charged particle as a single point charge of however much protonic charge is there, which is equivalent to its electric charge because these systems are spinning at the speed of light. Okay, and then the distance between them is a point on center distance, and the velocities here are the velocities of the systems. Okay, you can, if you actually move these systems. The, okay, the average velocity of the protons will be the velocity of the system. And this now allows us okay, to use all three of these together when we're discussing electronic systems. Okay, when I'm talking about electronic systems, I'm talking about doing electronics works with transistors and conductors and charged particles in semiconductors. 
Okay, these are what we are calling the electronic models, where we're using the electric charge approximation for new electromagnetism version 5. This is what we're going to use going forward for all of our experiments. Uh, and we're going to be using the legacy units because that's going to match the readings we're going to get from our instruments. Okay, and this is, and, and now what I've done is I've gotten rid of the red ink here. Okay, so because we're using these together, uh, the, uh, we're going to use these are the electronic version in legacy units. Again, we're going to be using electric charge approximation. I just dropped the red ink. That's all. That's just what you saw on the previous page. So this is what we're going to be using going forward to validate all the new electromagnetism V5. We're going to be using the electronic versions. As remember, in the pretonic versions up here that we saw here, when you're discussing pretonic systems, you only use these. Okay, this electric force model is only when the systems are far enough apart. You can use this approximation in lieu of these. Okay, but when you get to electronics, you can use all three of them because you're only considering these systems as electric charge approximations. Okay, and that's why new electromagnetism V5 is all three of these because at the electronic scale, you can use all three of them. Now, to be clear, if you go back to the electrogravity series of paper, this electric force model is not alone. There's also a torque model that goes with it. But the torque model is not seen when you do electronics. Okay, it's only seen at the atomic level. And we're going to explore that more much, much later. So now, let's get into each of the individual models. Okay, if you take the electric force model, this velocity is the velocity of the model of, of, the, of the electric charge equivalent, the electron. And because electrons moving in conductors move incredibly slow, okay, you can actually set this guy to zero, and you can see this is equivalent to Coulomb's model, because Km times C squared is equal to Ke, the electric field constant. Okay, and so this is Coulomb's model. And because there's an abundance of excellent legacy textbooks and online help that explain the application of Coulomb's model, I don't call it Coulomb's law. Okay, we don't have laws. What we have are mathematical models that mimic nature. Nature has laws. And it's arrogant to assume that our models are laws. They're not. They're models of what we believe nature does. And they should only be looked upon that until the day comes when we find better models to replace them. This crap where physicists say, ooh, Maxwell's equations are irrefutable is complete nonsense. Nothing we know is irrefutable. Okay, and the electro, new electro, like I've shown you in the past in the other videos for the, electro, the ethereal mechanics series, okay, we're going to have that paintbrush running up and down and we're going to keep filling in the holes until we can explain everything. Okay. So, we are not going to cover Coulomb's model anymore except when it comes up as part of an experiment that we're an experiment we're doing experiment for the other models. Okay, for the inertial force model is also known as new induction, which was developed from experimental data in the late 1990s. You can see the foundation series playlist. I'll also put a link out to my graduate thesis. Okay, the inertial force model is identical in form to new induction, except that the difference is, is that the inertial force model is derived directly from the pretonic fields. It's not taken from experiment. And you can, again, refer to the electrogravity playlist. It is derived in there. And because now we can origin it from a more fundamental model, we can link it directly as the force of gravity, not the field of gravity. Again, you got to see electrogravity. Um, we've had to split what the force and the field are of things. The force is not necessarily the field. Okay, and it's also the force of inertia, and it's also the force of induction, or electromagnetic induction. Okay, and this is the inertial force model. Okay, this model, the vector model, and the vortex model are identical, and so you can apply this as it is. And if you go to my graduate thesis, the link will be in the low bar. It's an exhaustive application of the new induction to solid conductive constructs with experimental verification. Again, we'll put the links in the low bar. 
And this was the experimental validation for experiments without ground plane. We did with one and two ground planes too. As far as I know, new induction is the only model that explains inductors sandwiched between two ground planes. And it is very, very, very accurate. But we're going to make it more accurate. We'll talk about that in a moment. There is also another document which has been around for nearly 20 years. Uh, which is New Induction Applications Volume 1. The links will also be found in the low bar. Uh, this was revised for New Electromagnetism Version 3. Don't worry about that. It cons considers only New Induction. Uh, basically, it's a change in format for, for this anyway. But I'm not going to change it. There might be some outdated nomenclature in here. Whatever. Uh, it'll be... It's, it's everything in here. The applications are good. Uh, the, the, re the simulations are good. Um, I haven't had anybody saying there's any mistakes in the math. The derivations are done out for you so you can see exactly how things are derived. Okay, getting back. What we are going to do with the inertial force model, the only thing we are going to do is we're going to rerun the thesis experiments. Now, the problem I had with the thesis experiments is I had to use an Agilent Precision LCR meter, which is a good device. Unfortunately, the problem with measuring inductance in this method here is the capacitive coupling between the winds or the turns of the inductor. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a newer method where we're going to use an oscilloscope, an arbitrary function generator, and a small one transistor circuit. And the objective of this is we're going to show you a method of measuring inductors without any capacitive coupling, or let, rather, more appropriate, minimized capacitive coupling and thereby bringing out the true inductive measurement. And my objective is to get to within 200 parts per million. I probably won't do that on the first iteration. I'll be happy with 2,000 parts per million, which is 0.2. And we'll evolve it uh, if we find ways to evolve it. You know, sometimes you have to do something before you say, oh, now I know how to make it better. Okay, I'll be very happy to get down from 0.2%. If you remember the experiments, okay, our best thing was like 3.4%, which is, this is actually quite good. Our average is around 2% here, okay? But I think we can do better. I want to get to 0.2%, okay? And then, so I want to get it better by a factor of 10 and then a factor of 10 again at a second iteration. Uh, the reason why, if you are my Patreon members, I've explained why we need to get down and get as much precision as possible because if there's any anomalies, the anomalies always show up in the very, very fine details. The old expression is God is in the details. Okay, so I want to get the precision down to see if there's any anomalies that we can't explain because that could be new physics. Okay, and what we're going to be spending the most time on is the magnetic force model. Again, this is a vortex equation. And also, you just can't, even if you understand how to do vortex algebra, you just can't go apply this to conductors in motion. We require a new magnet model, which will show you that there's another force that magnets produce. It's actually the actually produce an inertial force, and we'll be using the inertial field model from magnets that are in motion. Okay, and that requires a, there will be a paper released where we will cover the new electromagnetism V5 model of magnets in all its glory. Okay, and then there will be a ton of experiments. We're going to rerun all the subset of the PD experiments with much higher precision. Again, we're going into the hundreds of parts per million for our experiments. And then I also need to develop a more precise and reliable tool for quantified magnet edge currents. There's a lot more experiments we have to run. I ran out of time trying to uh, catalog them all, but you're going to see them when they come out anyway. So whether I explain them here or you see them later, it really doesn't matter. Okay, the objective is I want to get all the new electromagnetism V5 release done before my 2003 summer vacation because I want to use my summer vacation to kick off the cosmology section of ethereal mechanics. And I want to start building the galactic simulators. My Patreon members should know exactly what I'm referring to. So I want to thank to my Patreon subscribers. Your support has helped expand operations greatly with new equipment and facility expansion. I'm going to get the first uh, experimental design video out next weekend. My Patreon members have expressed a desire to see 
what goes into designing these experiments so they can kind of have a uh, come along that will, all those videos will only be for patreon members the actual experiments uh, details will be made public at a later time but the how-to videos will remain patreon only okay i'm not going to beg for help anymore i realized that this is such a niche thing that me begging i already have the smartest people in the world are my patreon members and i've got a decent amount of them and they're helping out with this effort i appreciate them i have engineers uh, that are patreon members and they're they're absolutely a great help and a joy thank you all um, and let me explain what i mean by no more voodoo physics you see in the mythology of voodoo you stick a pin into a, a voodoo doll and somebody you don't like uh, somewhere else screeches in pain well in voodoo there's no implied mechanism whereby that happens and there's that's a problem with physics in physics, they have these effects that they say happen, but they don't explain how. Like, relativity says, well, time dilation must occur. Well, what causes it? They don't know. They just know it must occur. And because they don't have a mechanism, they've got time dilation happening for all different reasons that are have all these independent mechanisms that make no sense or even contradictory. Uh, same with length contraction. And because they're not attributing length contraction to a particular mechanism, they've run into paradoxes, one of them being the latter paradox. I'm sorry, you can't just say something happens because. It has to have a reason why it happens, a mechanism which causes it to be true. Ethereal mechanics is explaining the mechanisms, okay, far greater than relativity or quantum mechanics is. And I, even though I, I've told you that we still have parts we don't understand, we have abstractions there, we will eventually fill in those abstractions. So anyway, again, no more voodoo physics. Thank you all.